Hello one and all, my name's John Clow, this is John Starkart, and as always, you are very welcome. Today's piece, which I'll bring up here now, is called Eating Crow. It's a phrase that I thought was quite interesting in a visual aspect. It's an American term. We say in the UK, eating humble pie. And I thought eating crow would be a great phrase to try and depict visually because essentially what it means, it means swallowing your pride. It means admitting to wrongdoing um, and showing humility in the face of wrongdoing. And I wanted to try and depict that somehow. I, I thought it was a very visual phrase. So the two things that I enjoy drawing most of all are skulls and corvids, you know, crows and your ravens and the like. And I thought it'd be quite interesting to kind of sh depict that visually somehow. So that's what I did. And what we're going to do now is we're going to jump into the, um, to how I did the piece. And we're going to do that now. So here we are. This is uh, Eating Crow. We are now in Procreate. And what we're going to do now is we're going to go into Canvas Information. Let's get that up. Here we are. And that this piece was started on the 10th of September last year. So yeah, it took me about going, if you're going to statistics, statistics, it took me 46 hours, 26 minutes, total strokes made 21,103. But as you can imagine, this wasn't all done in one sitting. So you're probably looking at about over the course of two weeks. I mean, this is actually one of the first pieces I did streaming on Twitch, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. But it was quite uh, an interesting experience to say the least, but it was done over like a few weeks. Uh, I think it was October before I got it finished in the end. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go, go into Time Lapse Replay. Here we are, Eat and Crow, and here I am roughing everything out, roughing out the skull, and our charismatic corvids. I think they're charismatic anyway. I like corvids, always have done. Find them very fascinating birds. Anyway, one second, we're gonna do that. If I'm gonna scrub back quickly because we're getting into the meat of it here. I know I've said this before, but let's just say this. I really take pride in, in the detail of my work and it's been commented on quite a lot. Wow, amazed by the amount of detail in your work. And yeah, it's something I take a lot of pride in. I wouldn't necessarily say I do line drawing per se. I mean, yes, I do use lines to rough things out. Of course I do. Most of the detail within my work is from YouTube, is from tongue, is from drawing things out and bringing up highlights and then adding in contrast. You know, it's that that really kind of gives um, uh, the piece a lot more presence. And especially with skulls, because skulls surprisingly are incredibly detailed. There's a lot of you know crevices, holes, dimples, features within within the structure of the human skull or any skull for that matter um, that are interesting to draw and are fascinating not just me but other artists throughout the years. I'm hardly unique in that. Again, just like really kind of uh, emphasizing the fact that I really take pride in the amount of detail that I put in. Also, as you can see here, let's punch in a little bit. You see, okay, Raven's in the way. Unfortunately, with this piece, I didn't actually preserve the layer, so I can't actually hop out and show you, unfortunately. But what I did here was, you can see that there's a Raven there, and it was kind of in the way of what I wanted to do. So I just shut that layer off temporarily so I could concentrate on what I'm drawing. And also, you can see me there I'm with the skull. Like, I'm kind of going over what, um, what I did and resizing. As I showed you in, I think it was Cerberus 2, where I why I resize the entirety of that skull. You don't necessarily just have to do that with an entire like um, figure within the drawing. You can do that in a piece. Say if the head's too big, you can reduce it. If the body's too large, you can reduce it. You know, if the proportions aren't correct, just by um, going into the selection tool, picking a piece out, you can then resize and reshape things as you go to to more be in keeping with what you're trying to execute. So there's me roughing out the lines and trying to line up where the bottom row of teeth are going to be. Also with this picture, if I can find the, if, if I can find the reference, I'll bring it up here now. There was a lot of teeth missing in the original piece. So I ended up having to go into other references in order to kind of um, to make sure that the, the piece had to, you know had a full set of teeth so to speak a full set of gnashes so here we are drawing everything out now and taking my time with it i hope resizing as i go and yes i'm using line work to kind of pick out pick out shapes here but then once the shapes are picked out then it's basically all shading from that point on adding that contrast and the funny thing is <laughs> the funny thing as well all that work there 
most of it doesn't even get shown in the final piece because there's a bloody big, great big Corvid in the way. But yeah, the fact that I, made, that I was able to do that and the fact that I was able to show you how to do it, it still means that there's, con there's consistency within the work. You know, I don't regret doing that work because that work was necessary in order for me to finish the piece. So let's move on a little bit. Here we are, now I'm drawing out another one of the Corvids. Well, the first of the Corvids. We'll scrub on a little bit and then get, again, like when it comes to, I'll, use, I'll, I'll draw out the shapes of the feathers and then I'll just fill them in with line work, with shading, with tone. Adding, subtracting as I go. Also when it comes to like, if you look at say like on the inside of the wings here, like you don't necessarily have to draw every bloody feather. If it's not shown, it's not shown, who cares? Do you know what I mean? But you can still in, you can still introduce detail just by like by inference, like just picking out certain areas and and adding in you know bringing them up a little bit, just to you know infer that there's something else that's going on. And again, like resizing, like drew out the feathers. I thought they were too long and looked weird, so I reduced them. I say it's probably one of the strengths and weaknesses of the way I work, because I'm not one of these artists who plans everything out meticulously beforehand. I know I've said this before. What I tend to do is I tend to have an idea in my head of what I want to achieve. And then I try and strive to work towards that initial idea as much as I can, as closely as I can. I think that in the main, I'm, you know, I'm pretty successful at it. It's probably why I sucked as an art student because I didn't do things as I was told. Not, not only that, I don't like doing what I'm told. <laughs> so that never helps. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing either. I mean, like at the end of the day, like everyone's creative process is different. Mine's going to be different to yours. Yours is going to be different to mine. At the end of the day, it's not about the process. It's about the end goal. It's about the piece that, that you finish, you know? You can't really judge a piece, I feel, until it's done. Something I'll probably talk about a bit later on. It's also why I don't do commissions. So yeah, just drawing out feathers. I mean, I, I love drawing crows. I think they're really charismatic birds. I think they're really cool. And again, I'm not the only artist who feels the same. You go and you, if you go on Pinterest, you go on Instagram, you go, there are plenty of artists out there who, who love crows as much as I do because of the symbolism behind them. They're fascinating. Um, in Irish mythology, the crow is associated with Morrigan and she's very similar to the Valkyrie in Norse mythology where they'll come down and they'll take the souls of the, those who have fallen in battle. Or in Norse mythology, again with Hugin and Munion, Thoughts and Memory, another piece I've done, which I'll talk about another time, where they're associated with the, yeah, Thoughts and Memory, the, the, the future and the past. Also, like um, I was recently reading with um, Stephen Fry's book, actually, it's a very good book, I do recommend it, in Mythos, how um, the white, the crow was initially white and then it pissed off Apollo and Apollo turned it black as a, as a punishment. It's like there's so much rich lore within Corvids. And the birds themselves are incredibly charismatic, incredibly intelligent. So you can understand why they've developed that kind of law over thousands of years. So we'll come back a little bit. So again, all I'm doing is I'm adding, you know, um, using my line work to depict my shapes, then using my tone to, using my mark making, my cross hatching, my shading to depict the detail. Literally all I'm doing here is I'm cleaning up, getting out rid of the bits I don't need, finishing the composition off, and we are done. That was Eating Crow. So let's round this out, shall we? Okay, that was Eating Crow. As I said before, I think I'm pretty happy with this piece. You know, I'm pretty proud of it. It took me a while to do, got there in the end. And funnily enough, I'm happy enough to put it up and sell on my website, John's Dark Art. Hey, hey! So again, it's up for sale on the website. Two sizes, A3, A4. Two prices, 45 and 75 euros a piece. So if you like what we do and you want to support it, please go to John's Dark Heart, go to the shop, pick a print up there. Be very much appreciated. Thank you. Like I said, this is a piece I'm very proud of. Um, I really like it personally. Funnily enough, it's one of the first pieces I um, started streaming with on Twitch. Now, I don't exactly have a huge following. The numbers are up at here now, only 57 of them as we stand at the moment. But it was one of the first pieces I was drawing on Twitch. And it's really interesting when you're streaming, seeing people like react to your drawing in real time. And I find that incredibly rewarding. It's why I still am um, on Twitch now, um, just to get online and do some drawings. One way, in one way, Twitch helps me because it gives me a set time and 
a set day to draw, which are usually at the moment, Saturday, Sundays, and Mondays at 1 p.m. Having a structure, having those set times, those set days, and as we sit down and focus on what, I'm, what I need to do to do that piece for usually about three, three and a half hours. That's when I think my concentration is usually at its best. After that, it starts to flag quite a lot. Yeah, it's really interesting doing that. Also like the whole social media aspect of showing your art, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's on Instagram, whether it's on Twitch, they're all very different mediums. With YouTube, it's more about me explaining to you about a piece in, in retrospect. In Twitch, it's about doing the piece in real time and showing how it's done in real time. Stuff like Instagram or TikTok is about showing it, um, showing the final piece. You know, all of them are quite useful in their own way in terms of showing the work and showing showing how the work is done or whatever else. Um, I find it incredibly rewarding. I mean, I still I still admit I need to grow grow out my audience quite substantially, but I think. If I keep persistent with it and I keep consistent with it, then there's every hope that that, could, that reality could manifest itself. Is there drawbacks? Yes, there is. This is the reason why I don't do commissions in general. Someone asked me to draw something for them. I mean, I won't say who it was, I won't say what it was, because I don't think that's particularly relevant. And about halfway through, because, you know, this person was watching me do it on Twitch, they started talking about their concerns of the piece. I'm not what concerns, it's not finished yet. But then this whole discussion happened and you know it was quite unfortunate in a way and, and the piece never got it never got finished because at the end of the day, you can't judge a piece until it's done. And even then with commissions, and this is a big problem with them I find, you know, oh yeah, could you change the size of the head? The eyes are a bit boss-eyed or something that some sort of what they think is a minor change ends up becoming a huge amount of work and you're not getting anything more for it. See, this is why right now, and this is the course that I'm gonna to stick to, is that what I wanna try and do is I wanna try and sell my work. I wanna try and find an audience for my work. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. That's why I'm doing YouTube. That's why I'm on TikTok, Instagram, Twitch. You know, I wanna get develop an audience for my work, for people who appreciate what I do. I find that when I'm motivated to do a piece because I want to do it, because I find that there's a story that I want to tell or an image that I want to depict or a symbolism that I want to represent. It's a personal piece and it gives me the motivation to complete it. Whereas if it's just a commission, I find it harder to do. I find it a lot harder to motivate myself purely, if you like, I mean, it sounds stupidly romantic and very typical of an artist, but I'm not really financially motivated. Yes, I would like to earn a living doing what I'm doing, but in terms of like, doing anything just to earn money no and you know it's just not in me to do that and i'm not castigating anyone whose motivation it is to do that if that is your motivation then have at it man godspeed to you but it's just not for me and i'm old enough now to know what exactly what i want to do you know benefits of going have, having the experience that I've had, you know, coming at it from a 42 year old rather than a 22 year old. Yeah, I think it's important to kind of, I think for me anyway, it's important for me, and maybe it's important for you, that you'll probably end up being more successful when, as an artist, and whatever way you deem, whatever metric you use to measure success, you end up being more successful if you're doing pieces that are true to you. Because when it comes down to it, the value of the art is the artist. You know, I'm not one of these people who believes that you can separate the art from the artist because no one would be interested in a Pablo Picasso work if it wasn't made by Pablo Picasso. No one would be interested in a Leonardo da Vinci work if it wasn't made by Leonardo da Vinci. The two intrin are intrinsically linked. Whether or not you like the person, like my favorite artist of all time is uh, Michael Michelangelo Maurizio di Caravaggio. The guy was up. See you next Tuesday, um, to put it politely. He was not a good person but he created amazing work. Whether you like someone or not, whether whether there's a cloud of controversy over them as a person and what they do outside of the work that they execute, you can't really separate the art from the artist, I don't feel. And I'm sure there's people who feel contrary to that. And if you do, you do. I'm not really getting into an argument here or a debate, but it's just something that I feel personally. To round this out, I think it's important that an artist stays true to themselves. That's what I feel is important. I need to feel, I need to be true to myself. I need to execute on the work that I feel is important to me. And hopefully it resonates with enough people that I can 
earn a living doing what I'm doing. And this YouTube video enables me to reach out to enough people where that's possible. If you stay true to yourself, and you stay true to the work that you're doing, it will be hard because there's nothing. There's no such thing as easy money. There's no such thing as easy success. You have to work for it. And that work needs to be consistent. If you do that, you will get to where you're going eventually. And I think I'm going to leave it there. So my name has been John Clow. This has been John Starcart. And as always, you'd be very welcome. Until next time.